Have you ever wondered what happens when the body starts eating itself? I'm not tone deaf and neither are you. And while many of us are watching videos like this from the comfort of home, probably with a snack within reach, a lot of people are dying of famine. Right freaking now. This isn't a topic that I take lightly and it's not meant to shock you or to guilt you, but sometimes understanding the science can bring clarity and maybe a little more empathy. Most of us have never gone more than a day without food by choice, let alone being forced into crisis, conflict, or collapse. And for those of us living far from that kind of reality, those of us who've never had to worry where the next meal is coming from, it's hard to grasp what starvation actually does to the human body and we forget that it isn't built to survive it for very long. So everybody knows about Ukraine, everybody knows about Gaza. This place is, is unknown. It's kind of a very quiet, very quiet famine. And over 30 million, that's half the population, are in need of food and humanitarian aid. And for every number in a report, there's a real body struggling to keep going without fuel. Because starvation isn't just being hungry. It's a full body injury and it unfolds in a very specific, brutal timeline. We're gonna walk through what happens inside the body when food disappears, how it tries to adapt, what breaks down first, and how it becomes fatal. Not to sensationalize, because understanding this process helps us grasp just how resilient and vulnerable the human body really is. If you live in a part of the world where this is hard to imagine, then maybe it's worth taking a moment to understand what's going on. If you are a returning viewer, do me a solid and give the video a like and share your comments below so that I can know where you come down on this topic. If you're new to the channel, welcome, watch the video first, and if so inclined, join our army of intelligent interns at the end. And don't forget to subscribe with notifications so that you can be alerted when I post content related to your health and the environment around you. Let's get to a million together and have everyone arrive there even smarter than they were before. And if you dig what I do and want to support the team even more, consider becoming a member. Now that I have whet your appetite, let's proceed. So what is starvation physiologically? Starvation isn't just not eating. It's the body running out of usable fuel. First glycogen, then fat, and eventually muscle. It's a whole body energy crisis. Every system starts to slow down. Digestion, reproduction, immunity, even growth and repair, they all get deprioritized. Because the body's only job now is survival. It has to stretch every last calorie as far as it can. That's why starvation follows a specific timeline. Not everything fails at once. So what shuts down first? Well, no surprise, energy depletion is the body's first response to starvation. But what does that actually mean biologically? Let's bring it to Hank Green from SciShow to break it down because he's got a great video on the topic. In your normal, well-fed state, your body breaks down glycogen molecules to produce glucose, the friendly carbohydrate that keeps your cells well-fed and functioning. Your body depends on a steady supply of glucose, but that glucose doesn't come from thin air. It's pulled from glycogen, stored sugar in your liver and muscles that acts as a quick access energy reserve. The average person can typically go about six hours after feeding in the glucose burning phase before they start feeling hungry and probably grumpy. At that point, your body has burned through all that lunchtime glucose and is turning toward fatty acids. Now, feeling hangry after a few hours? That's normal, not starvation. Just skipped lunch but those glycogen stores don't last long. Real energy depletion hits when glycogen runs out completely, usually between 24 and 72 hours without food. This switch kicks off the first big metabolic shift as your body enters phase two of starvation, fat burning. At that point, your body has no sugar left to burn, so it shifts gears, moving into fat burning mode. This metabolic pivot, called ketosis, is a clear signal. Your body is switching from normal daily operations into emergency survival mode. It essentially buys the body some time, maybe a few weeks, give or take, but that switch comes with trade-offs. Metabolism slows down, hormones shift, and the body conserves tissue wherever possible. To understand how this fuel shift works at a chemical level, Here's a closer look. During this stage called ketosis, our livers metabolize fatty acids into smaller fat chain derivatives called ketone bodies. They replace glucose as the main energy source. Ketones, a backup fuel source that keeps essential organs, especially the brain, alive and functioning. In fact, 
the primary reason the body shifts to producing ketones is because of the brain. And our brains are a big energy suck. They demand about 25% of our stored energy to function properly. They're kind of greedy like that, needing about 120 grams of glucose a day to stay happy. The brain is one of the most energy hungry organs we have. And while most of the body can adapt to burning fat, the brain is a special case. It doesn't give up its glucose habits easily. In the first 24 to 48 hours of starvation, while the rest of the body shifts to fat for fuel, the brain drains the last bit of glucose still circulating. So in your first day or two without food, while the rest of your body starts fueling itself on fatty acids, the brain drains the last bit of stored glucose until it really runs out. But even when glucose runs out, the brain isn't done. Starvation mode triggers what's essentially a strategic recalibration because the brain can't use fatty acids directly. Your brain can't directly use those fatty acids as fuel because they're too big to squeeze through the blood-brain barrier. Exactly. They're simply too large to cross the blood-brain barrier. So around day two or three, in the final hour before the brain would otherwise be out of options, something remarkable happens. Within a few days of no food, your brain recalibrates its glucose requirement from 120 grams to about 30 grams, and it changes the menu. The brain now starts eating those processed ketone bodies, which, because they're smaller than fatty acids, can get through the blood-brain barrier. This is a critical adaptation in human evolution. Our species has gone through many cycles of feast and famine, and this metabolic backup plan is what kept us sharp when it mattered most. This is a great evolution trick to keep us alert enough, no matter how hungry we are, to continue to look for food. It keeps basic cognitive functions going just long enough to make it to the next meal. But make no mistake, even with this adjustment, the brain is under strain. Cognitive decline starts creeping in, not just from energy loss, but from the stress of starvation itself. Irritability, confusion, mood swings, brain fog, slowed thinking, even hallucinations in later stages. And if starvation is happening in a context of trauma or displacement, those factors are even magnified. The brain isn't just hungry, it's overwhelmed. But 14-year-old Mossab al-Dibs is clinging to life, first paralyzed by an airstrike, then losing 30 kilos due to a shortage of nutrient formula. At this point, survival means sacrifice, and the only fuel left is you. The next phase is muscle breakdown and physical wasting. Once fat reserves are depleted, the body enters its final metabolic stage a desperate state where it begins breaking down its last internal reserves, protein. Proteins are essential for proper cell functioning, so things go downhill pretty quickly as your body starts eating itself, basically, in a process of internal self-cannibalism called catabolysis. Protein catabolism typically starts after a few weeks and can last a few more, but often accelerates in crisis settings. This is when the body is reaching into its back pocket, the reserves of the reserves. Muscle tissue gets broken down, divvied up, and distributed to keep essential systems running. This phase is marked by rapid muscle depletion, as your body cells start to break down their own proteins into amino acids, which your brain now gobbles up. Those amino acids can be converted into glucose, buying a bit more time for survival. But these are structural materials, not fuel. They're meant to build tissue, not burn. Another trade-off that comes at a steep cost. As protein stores are consumed, muscle loss accelerates, and what was once strength becomes fragility. Skeletal muscles shrink, leading to weakness, instability, and eventually the inability to walk or even lift oneself. The heart, also a muscle, begins to deteriorate. Its walls thin, contractions weaken, and the risk of arrhythmia or heart failure rises. Bones also suffer. With little nutrition, nutrition and disrupted hormones, they become porous and brittle, increasing the risk of fractures even from minor trauma. Wound healing slows to a crawl. The energy for movement and repair disappears. This is the body turning inward, consuming itself piece by piece, and the strength to carry oneself is all but gone. The little girl's deterioration is painful and slow, but there's very little anyone can do. The damage then spreads beyond the muscles, deeper into the body's core. As the body scrapes the bottom of the barrel, 
core systems begin shutting down. Metabolism continues its slowdown, an attempt to conserve what little energy remains. Even in warm environments, the person may feel chilled to the bone, not only due to loss of insulating fat and muscle, but because the body can no longer regulate internal temperature properly. Hormonal output drops, thyroid activity slows, and thermogenesis, the body's ability to produce heat, plummets. Internally, the situation is deteriorating fast, and now even organ function begins to decline. The liver, once responsible for clearing toxins and keeping blood chemistry stable, starts to fail, allowing waste products to build up in the bloodstream. The kidneys, struggling to maintain fluid and electrolyte balance, can no longer filter properly. This is known as renal shutdown. Without them, the body loses its ability to regulate hydration, blood pressure, and even heart rhythm. What we would call a healthy child under age five. And as we move it, this yellow here, that's moderate malnutrition, and the red is severe acute malnutrition. Meanwhile, the gut lining thins, the lungs weaken, and the pancreas falters, setting the stage for the next and most dangerous collapse, the immune system. The immune system is not a single system. It's a network that touches every part of the body. The gut, home to over 70% of the immune system, begins to unravel. When the gut lining breaks down, bacteria and toxins can leak into the bloodstream, triggering systemic inflammation or even sepsis. A barrier once designed to keep invaders out is now letting them in. The lungs, constantly exposed to the outside world, are one of the immune system's front lines. But with weakened respiratory muscles and low oxygen levels, the lungs can no longer defend themselves. Infections that would have been manageable now take hold easily and spread fast. Even the pancreas, while not an immune organ itself, plays a role. With blood sugar regulation collapsing, immune cells lose a key energy source. And even if food were suddenly available, pancreatic dysfunction would mean poor digestion and limited nutrient absorption, cutting off the fuel needed to mount any kind of defense. Without that fuel, the immune system simply cannot function. At this point, the body is trapped in a dangerous downward spiral, one that's increasingly difficult to reverse. It's important to understand that people don't just die from starvation. They die from infections their body can't fight anymore. Keep in mind that by this point, your body is so grossly deficient in vitamins and minerals and has such a weakened immune system that just about anything could kill you. Many children especially never even reach that stage of starvation because they succumb to illness far earlier in the acute malnutrition. Wounds stay open, viruses run unchecked, even minor illnesses can become fatal. But more often than not, people facing involuntary starvation aren't dealing with minor illnesses or injuries. They're often fighting for survival against overwhelming odds. That's why this next part is something we really need to consider. Compounding conflict zone stressors. Up to this point, we've been focused on the science, which is important, but context matters. So she ended up coming in with um, you know, extensive burns, explosive injuries with shrapnel, major surgery for the burns with skin grafts. She had lost vision in one eye and she was intubated. She couldn't breathe on her own because of inhalation from the smoke and fire. Starvation usually doesn't just happen in a vacuum. It's layered on top of everything else. Injuries from violence or structural collapse, dehydration from limited access to clean water, burns, fractures, infections with no treatment, mental strain from fear, grief, and ongoing instability. The stress of it all, both physical and mental, is unfathomable for most of us. I think I, f I felt at times that this was so barbaric, what was going on in terms of the numbers of children coming through the doors with bits of their bodies blown off. So no, the body isn't just starving. It's trying to heal, fight, and survive all at once. And remember, the process of mobilizing and using whatever energy it can find speeds up under stress. When the body is stuck in fight or flight mode, it burns through energy faster. But in starvation, there's nothing left to burn. So as we reach the end stages, starvation culminates in a painful, prolonged decline marked by multi-organ failure and ultimately cardiac arrest. It's a harsh reminder of how deeply the body depends on steady nourishment to function. Now, I'm not sharing these realities to shock. These are real people, real bodies, enduring unimaginable hardship. Understanding what happens inside 
helps us connect with human cost beyond any politics or any headlines. They're doing at least 10 surgeries a day and the bulk are children. Even if this feels distant or overwhelming, it's worth pausing to reflect, to appreciate the simple things we often take for granted. How we live with gratitude and grace, not just for ourselves, but for others and this planet, shapes the world that we share. All of that to say, the human body is incredibly resilient. With proper support, recovery is possible. The human spirit can persevere through unimaginable circumstances. But this kind of suffering isn't something anyone should have to endure. If there's something we can do, anything, to ease that burden or help prevent it from happening again, it's worth doing. This won't solve everything. But understanding the cost and choosing to care is where it starts. Thanks for joining me in this discussion about what happens when the body eats itself. Please share your thoughts in the comment section below. This was a heavier topic for this channel. But if you are looking to become smarter and learn about medical topics that involve your body, the world around you, current trends, and pop culture, join the intern army and click on your notifications to catch my uploads every Monday morning. And don't forget to follow my gym, Human 2.0 Fitness, for free right here on YouTube, where we post content that helps you move better and prevent injury. Or it's sister channel human at home where we show you how to be healthy in the space where you live otherwise as always that's been a word from dr chris rayner not your everyday ortho where we see one do one teach one